Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jen Hopey Ferguson and I'm joining you tonight from the traditional and unceded territory of the Nanaimo people, also known as Nanaimo, Vancouver Island. And uh, really grateful to be here with you this evening and grateful um, to this name of people for sharing this land where we get to live, work and adventure um, here on Vancouver Island, really grateful. Um, I'm also joined by uh, some really amazing people, um, some of my favorite uh, nerds in science, which, um, and I mean that really affectionately. Um, so I'm gonna introduce first, uh, Dr. John Cassidy. He's an earthquake seismologist with Natural Resources Canada. Uh, we also have Allison Bird, who is also an earthquake seismologist and the outreach and liaison officer for the earthquake, earthquake early warning. I learned today that there is a difference between an earthquake seismologist and a seismologist. So we can ask Dr. John and Allison about that later, but uh, that was a fun fact for me. Uh, we also have Mark Spencer, who is joining us from uh, BC Hydro. They're a great partner with us and he is the public safety advisor. And then Jerry Grant, the emergency, um, the emergency coordinator with Juan de Fuca in the Capital Regional District. So um, thanks to all of you for being here tonight. And with that, I'm going to turn it over first uh, to Allison to share a little bit about a little bit of an overview. But oh, actually, before we do that, Allison, let's do a quick poll and find out where folks are joining us from. So before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll here. You should see a poll now on your screen and you can go ahead and um, just share with us where you're joining from. Looks like the lower mainland is winning so far. <laughs> A few more folks, you should see that under, um, you should just see it, the poll should light up for you. So if you wanna just let us know where you're joining from, that would be great. Helpful for us to just get a sense. And if you don't see the poll, that's okay. Okay, so it looks like pretty even split between um, the lower mainland and Vancouver Island so far. So that's always interesting for us to see. I'm sure additional folks will join as we um, go through our session today. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Allison. Okay, I just have a few slides to show you so, uh, to give you an idea of uh, what we do here in, in uh, British Columbia in terms of earthquakes. So um, let's see if I can get these to advance. Okay, so um, John and I are, are seismologists on Vancouver Island. And uh, the, one of the reasons I think we both really like working here is because we've got all three, three major types of plate boundary right off our coastline. We have a, a small mid ocean ridge where um, the Juan de Fuca Ridge, where the Pacific plate and the Juan de Fuca plate move apart. We have the uh, strike slip Queen Charlotte Fault along the west coast of Haida Gwaii. And then for people in, in the uh, lower mainland and uh, Vancouver Island area, we have the uh, northern end of the Cascadia subduction zone and su subduction zones where you get the largest earthquakes in the world. And in between those really large earthquakes, we have earthquakes within the North America plate. That's the one we live on. And also within the subducting Juan de Fuca plate, uh, which is bending and going down underneath us. Uh, we have a few pictures here of the typical types of damage we get in earthquakes. So um, there's unreinforced masonry tends to do not very well in earthquakes. Uh, you can see here the, the wall has sort of bowed out. It's no longer supporting the roof and, and floor, but there's a table there. And if you'd gotten underneath that table during that earthquake, you would have been really quite safe, much safer than had you tried to walk out that dark doorway where all the bricks have fallen down. Um, sometimes uh, there's poorly reinforced concrete. This is from Kobe, Japan. There's really great rebar going up the columns and along the beams, but there's not enough transverse for wraps reinforcement holding that together so it can stay linear and do its job and hold up that beam. And then of course there's soft stories um, in older building where you have uh, parking or shops on the ground floor and that's a weaker floor and it tends to fail. You can design against that in, in modern buildings, however. Most people, however, are coming to us from their homes. Um, homes generally do quite well in earthquakes. Where they tend to fail are things like porches and poorly constructed additions. Um, chimneys, especially if that chimney falls toward the house. I'm doing it like this because I have actually a chimney right beside me. Um, and then uh, we um, also have uh, garages that tend to fail because there's a big, weak wall in that garage. Um, 
Now, uh, there are things you can do to make yourself safer in these situations, but we can get into those later. Most people, however, um, in North American architecture are not ex don't experience structural damage, but they do experience internal disarray and are more likely to be uh, injured by falling debris. So on the left-hand side here, we have a very dramatic and traumatic picture from the uh, Napa Valley earthquake. Uh, and then on the right here, we have a typical office situation. We have light fixtures, ceiling tiles, and other furniture that can, um, that can impact you. So um, tsunamis can sometimes be generated by earthquakes. They are most often generated by a subduction style earthquake, um, but can also be triggered by landslides into water um, and other phenomena such as weather, weather and meteors. Uh, I have a short image here of the uh, Cascadia model for what would happen in our situation um, with the, the water coming around uh, the, the southern part of Vancouver Island. It takes about an hour and 15 minutes to get to Victoria and about two hours to get around to Vancouver where it'd be just low lying flooding and strong currents. But I need to point out the first wave is usually not the highest. It's often the second, third or fourth that is much, much bigger. And these are very strong, powerful waves. There's a lot of mass and momentum behind them and they can really, even a short wave can sweep you off your feet and, and cause quite a bit of damage. So uh, beforehand, uh, we encourage people to ha have their kit and their plan. Uh, I live on Vancouver Island, so my kit's at least a two week kit. Uh, our neighbors tease us that that's, you know, they're just gonna come to our house, but you know, you really need to um, be independent and have your own kit. Um, I encourage you to look at the, the prepared BC guides. They have a lot of fantastic information. Um, do put a pair of sturdy shoes and a flashlight under your bed and a dust mask. Um, if it happens at night, if an earthquake happens at night, there could be broken glass and other debris. It will be dark because there probably won't be any electricity. You don't want to be walking on that as slippers or bare feet and you want to be able to see where you're going. Also, your camping equipment makes a really good start to the kit. And we encourage you to just go around your house and look at things that could fail and figure out how you can make them safer, like um, strapping uh, tall or heavy furniture to studs and also storing heavier items on lower shelves. Um, during the earthquake, of course, we want you to do the drop cover and hold on. And um, it's a good idea to go around in your house, think about where you will go in each room and actually physically get into that space to practice it. And um, Donna and I thank you very much. Hey, thanks so much, Allison. I love the reminders about um, practicing, right? That's what ShakeOut, which is happening tomorrow. That's so important. It's that muscle memory. We get in there, we practice, we get under the coffee table in our, in our dining room or under our dining table. And it's just a really good opportunity to, um, to just to create that muscle memory. So we know what to do when there's an earthquake. Um, I, I want to ask uh, John and Allison, I've got a, a few questions here. So my first question is, I mean, I really think they have kind of the coolest job because they get to study earthquakes. And um, so I really am interested to know what do you like best about your job and why did you choose to become a seismologist? Don't I don't know who wants first. to go first, John, maybe. John, you're muted. I should be used to this by now after a year and a half. Um, thanks, Jen. Um, I love everything about my job. I, I, I love knowing that the, the research that we're doing is applied, that, that it feeds directly into our building codes and bridge codes. It's information that is used by engineers and used by uh, local community planners. And it makes a difference. Um, so the, the research that we're doing um, clearly makes a difference. We've seen that in large earthquakes around the world in, in Chile and in Japan. So we've seen the improvements in building codes. So no, knowing that it makes a difference and being able to work with so many um, others who are, are really um, so keen and devoted uh, emergency managers and planners and engineers and community groups, um, so that, that really is, is um, what I love about the job. Um, what sort of triggered my interest was as a, as a, uh, as a young child, um, it was a trip to California just after an earthquake and, and seeing, seeing what happened after a major 
earthquake uh, in California, the, the damage to buildings and freeways and overpasses. And, um, and then many years later, when I was in university studying physics um, and studying waves, I realized that studying waves has a very clear application to earthquake hazards. So I sort of put those two things together and, and then went into, went into uh, graduate school in, in earth science and, and earthquake studies, so. Great. And I know Allison is a, is a STEM girl. She's a, she's science. We were, we were talking yesterday very affectionately or not yesterday, I guess it was last week. Um, we should call her size Miguel. We thought that was like kind of a cool superhero-esque kind of person. So Allison, what made you interested in, in seismology? Well, um, I, I, I took a similar route to John. I, I did my first degree in physics and, um, and I started realizing I wanted to go study more. And I learned that you could take courses in earthquakes. And I thought, how cool is that? Um, I, I felt an earthquake and I, and I thought about the masses that needed to move to create that earthquake. And I just, and I still think it's mind boggling, you know, 25 or so years later. Um, it, it really is um, remarkable. I love the technology that we get to use. I love that the research is applicable, like John said. And, and what I really enjoy are things like this. I love the outreach. I love meeting people and talking about earthquakes with them and, and sharing knowledge. And uh, I love the fact that, that, that this is a science that is um, gonna help humans and, and the environment. Great, awesome, thank you. Um, we've got a, a couple of questions. We've got someone who's joined us. I won't, I won't identify them unless they're comfortable with that, but who has indicated that they were in Tokyo when a big earthquake happened. And I think, and so Jerry, maybe I'll go to you. Um, we know that people's experience with past disasters or earthquakes, for example, really does often fuel their, either their interest in being more prepared or, um, you know, uh, uh, sometimes fear. So maybe you could just share with us, Jerry, some of the things that we need to be thinking about from an emergency preparedness perspective or and the role of local government. Well, first and foremost, I really believe uh, you need to have a plan. How do you know what you're going to do if you don't plan for it in advance? One of the things when you're planning, and it seems like a very small thing, is having that out of uh, area contact person for every member of your family, extended family that lives on the coast of British Columbia. So your contact person is not going to be like, I live in uh, Greater Victoria. My contact person is not going to be in Vancouver. My contact person is gonna be on the other side of the Rocky Mountains. So for everybody that's listening, it has to be far enough away. You're gonna have all your family members have that one person as the contact person. And you're not going to phone them because phone lines probably aren't going to be working. One of the things that came out of Fukushima was that uh, by using text messages, um, even though uh, phone lines were busy, cell towers were down, um, text messages were held in a queue. They're all time stamped and they all eventually got through. So if you can, you know, everybody agree on who your contact person is, and that's the person you're all gonna text to, and that's where you're gonna get information back and forth. Um, what was the other part of the question? Just some of the, what does local government do? So you're working so, with the Capital Regional District oh, in yeah, Wanda, so, so local government, part of what we do is we try to go and uh, teach different preparedness, how to, how to be self-sufficient, how to look after yourself. But when the event happens, of course, we'll go into response mode. Most people don't realize almost everybody in the emergency program is a volunteer. It's just a few people that, you know, that are paid employees, either part-time or full-time. So when you keep that in your mind, when the earthquake happens, it happens to all of us. So first and foremost, we have to look after our families. So for local government, you know, all about volunteers, we're not coming to your door right away. It's gonna take us a long time. That includes your fire department. That includes BC ambulance. It includes all those different things. So this is why we try to do the get prepared ahead of time. So you're self-sufficient ahead of time. And I, I'll answer more questions as we go on because I could talk forever on prepared. Right. Thanks so much, Jerry. That's great. And I think such, you know, such an, such an important reminder that, um, you know, it's a little bit about setting expectations that we, and Allison mentioned it as well. You know, we live on the coast. We need to be ready for up to 14 days. And that really has been a shift over the last couple of years. We've gone from about that 
72 hours or so to being ready for between seven and 14 days. And, and we need to be self-sufficient. And so I think that that's such an important reminder. Um, one of the questions in the chat was, you know, a question around school districts taking part and what initiatives um, have been, been taken in the lower mainland with respect to school districts. So we absolutely do outreach with schools and um, the school districts do register to participate in ShakeOut. I know uh, my daughter's school, I'm here in Nanaimo, school district 68, and they are doing a, a full scale uh, ShakeOut drill tomorrow, post-secondary institutions, including Simon Fraser and Vancouver Island University, University of Victoria, among others, are also doing full scale drills tomorrow. So um, that outreach really does happen. And there is you know, a, a concerted effort on behalf of the Earthquake Alliance and the ShakeOut teams to, um, you know, to, to be doing that, that sort of outreach. So uh, great question. Um, so I think I'm just trying to read the questions here, but maybe I'll come back to that one. Um, I think maybe we could shift back to some, some of these uh, common sort of earthquake uh, questions or maybe some, some of the things that people aren't aware of. So John or maybe Allison, um, maybe you could share with me where the largest earthquakes are most likely to occur in Canada and um, how we would feel a quake here on the coast. I know, Allison, you showed us that great graphic, um, but maybe you could just share with us like what that feels like. Or John. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll uh... jump in. Uh, the, the largest earthquakes in Canada and the most frequent earth, earthquakes in the country are right here along the West Coast. And the reason for that is the active plate boundaries. So the, the diagrams that Allison showed where the plates are either sliding past one another, moving apart or colliding, those huge tectonic plates are moving at about the same speed that your fingernails grow. It's several centimeters each year. Over a hundred years, that represents several meters of movement. And so that's the ultimate cause of earthquakes and also the volcanoes that, that, uh, that we see in our region, the beautiful Mount Baker and Garibaldi. So it's the tectonics that, that cause the earthquakes. And we've seen um, amongst the world's largest earthquakes off of our coast. So up to the magnitude nine range. Uh, so these are huge earthquakes. They're, they don't happen very often. They're typically centuries apart for the magnitude nines. Um, we've seen damaging earthquakes through, through British Columbia on average uh, one or two decades apart. So every, every decade or so, we see an earthquake that is capable or has caused damage. And every single day, we see tiny earthquakes. Um, one just south of Victoria this morning that, that nobody felt. One on the Sunshine Coast yesterday that uh, a few people felt. But every single day, uh, small earthquakes are occurring throughout this region because of the movement of, of those plates. I think this is the perfect segue to another poll, John. Um, I think we could ask folks, um, this is a really common thing that we hear, which is, so you can answer in the poll, true or false. Lots of smaller earthquakes release the pressure, making the big one or those very large earthquakes less likely. True or false? Give folks a minute here to answer in the poll. So true or false, lots of smaller earthquakes release the pressure, making the big one less likely. And this is anonymous, by the way, so it's okay to take a guess if you, if you aren't sure. <laughs> we won't judge, we promise. Okay, so it looks like most folks got this correct. So John, this is a common myth that you hear really regularly, I think. Um, certainly we see a lot of it. I hear it every day when I'm talking with folks about um, risk communication is we hear, well, if we have a whole bunch of smaller quakes that releases the pressure. Can you just debunk that a little bit for us? Yeah, and that's, that's a really common myth. It really is. Uh, we hear that all the time. Allison and I will um, deal with this question on a regular basis. The, the magnitude scale that we use, say a magnitude three, where people may feel shaking, you might feel one or two seconds of 
of shaking from an earthquake. If you go to a magnitude four, the shaking is 10 times stronger and there's 32 times more energy released. So things go up very, very quickly with earthquake magnitude. So if you're looking at a magnitude three to a magnitude nine, which is the largest in the offshore region, um, it takes a, a, a magnitude nine releases as much energy as 1.1 billion magnitude threes. So it's, it just increases astronomically. It's, um, uh, so you, you simply, the tiny earthquakes that we record in this area every day, the little magnitude ones and twos, uh, are really just a drop in the bucket. They're so tiny, they're not even, even coming close to being able to release the energy of a, of a magnitude eight or nine earthquake and they're not on the same fault. So, so it really is, these tiny earthquakes are reminders and they're useful for us scientifically, um, but they're not releasing the energy that, that we know uh, is being stored in, in this, across the region. And we've been experiencing, I know you've been posting and tweeting a lot about the episodic uh, tremors that have been occurring most recently. Can you just, you know, I, I see sometimes you say 400 earthquakes on Vancouver Island in the last 24 hours, like that's mind boggling to me. So can you just share a little bit about episodic tremors and sort of what's <clears throat> happening right now, how often that happens? Sure. So it, it, it's, it's a regular event. And um, the, these little tremors, these, they're tiny, tiny tremors. They're the equivalent of magnitude minus one or magnitude zero or magnitude one earthquakes. They're very tiny, but they're not earthquakes. They're, they, they're, they're, they have a very different uh, signal, a very different characteristic. It's uh, noise or waves that build up slowly and then drop off. So it, it is very different from an earthquake signal. So these are not um, earthquakes, but they occur um, in this region, thousands of them at a time within a, within a period of one or two weeks, um, about every 14 months here on Vancouver Island. So it's, um, it's a regular occurrence. We see thousands of these tiny shaking events. And, and at the same time, that these tremors are taking place, we typically find that Vancouver Island, that normally is moving very slowly towards Vancouver, towards the mainland, uh, by maybe a centimeter each year. Uh, when these tremors are taking place, Vancouver Island changes direction and moves back towards Japan, moves to the, the southwest. So, a few millimeters. So, you know, a couple of the thickness of two or three dimes. So it's not a lot of movement, but it really is quite a, it, it was discovered about 20 years ago. Um, it's quite a remarkable phenomenon that we see throughout the Cascadia from California to Northern Vancouver Island uh, at different times and along, along the fault. Um, so it's, and we're still learning a lot about these events. But we know that they happen in, in subduction zones around the world, in Japan and Alaska uh, and Chile. So th they are really a very good reminder that this is an active subduction zone. And again, scientifically, they're very helpful. Um, in Japan, we know that where the tremors occur tell us where those big subduction earthquakes, where the rupture uh, basically stops. So it's, the, it's important new data, it's being used in our building codes. We still have a lot to learn. There's still a lot of things that we don't understand about these ETS events, but, um, but they are a regular occurrence. So that's, um, you know, they're, they're, they happen every year or so. That's great, thanks, John. I, I just, I, I find it so fascinating how, you know, the, the length of your thumbnail, you know, that we're moving, that that is, you know, reasonably significant movement or, you know, the width of a dime, which we wouldn't give a thought to as being significant, but it is in this, in this context. Um, and if folks are interested in, in seeing all the awesome data that John posts, you can follow him at Earthquake Guy on Twitter. So that's a, a little plug for you, John. Um, and Allison, maybe I could shift gears to you. And uh, Jennifer has asked a, a great question in the chat and she's wondering, uh, what would the duration be of a large earthquake? So I guess yeah, that's how it feels. Question. question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, the the larger the earthquake, um, 
the, the more dramatic the shaking, but also the longer it goes on. So when you have small earthquakes, they only last a few seconds. Um, magnitude seven earthquakes typically, typically last about a minute or so. And then the magnitude nines that we were describing, they can last three to five minutes. And I think because it's such an unusual extreme experience, it will probably seem like a lot longer, um, but um, it's one of the things that it's good to do when you've done your drop cover hold on and you're underneath your table is to count. There are two reasons for that. As you count, you're, you're realizing how long that earthquake is going on for and realizing how big it is. But the other thing is it, counting is a calming mechanism because counting is one of the first things you learn when you're little. So it's one of those things that can help, uh, you know, like calm yourself in, in, in a very extreme experience. Um, it's very unusual for um, earthquakes to last longer than that, uh, but, but it, it is feasible, but it's very, very unusual. Unmute. Okay. How about uh, let's let's maybe just change gears here a little bit. And we know that um, earthquakes can cause tsunamis. Um, so I'm going to do another little poll here about tsunamis, and we'll just see how folks feel about this. So the question here is: Every earthquake causes a tsunami, can cause a tsunami. True or false? We'll see how people, folks respond. That's in the poll. So feel free to add that in people a minute. Everybody's so fast with the responses. That's great. So we'll share this back. It's a bit of a mixed bag, but most folks feel like that's false. Um, so we know every, every earthquake does not cause a tsunami and every tsunami is not caused by an earthquake. So um, maybe you could just share a little bit about uh, about sort of tsunamis as they relate to what we can expect here on the coast. I don't know if that's Allison or John. And then maybe Allison, you could share the early warning or earthquake early warning pro project that you've been working on. Sure, maybe John should speak about the tsunami then. Sure. Um, so uh, the, the poll is, is correct. I mean, uh, not every earthquake will cause a tsunami. So the most common um, trigger for a tsunami is a, a large earthquake beneath the seafloor, beneath the ocean. And it's the vertical movement of the seafloor that um, starts the wave. And so these big Pacific wide tsunamis um, that we've seen in the past, typically we're talking about very, very large subduction earthquakes. We're talking about earthquakes of magnitude eight to nine. So amongst the largest in the world. Um, and the seafloor movement that you, that you can see during these large earthquakes can be as large as 20, 30, or 40, or even more uh, meters. So the seafloor actually, um, you know, you're seeing very significant movements on the seafloor during the largest of the earthquakes. And it's like having a piece of wood or plywood in a, in a pool. You lift it, you're, you're starting a wave, and it travels across the ocean. So... Those tsunamis in the open ocean travel at the same speed as a jet. Um, so as a, a typical commercial airline. So for a large earthquake off of Alaska, it's typically a few hours before we would see uh, impacts here in, in, on Vancouver Island, like the 1964 um, <clears throat> tsunami and earthquake. So, uh, but it's also important to know that any uh, strong earthquake, even um, beneath land can potentially trigger landslides into a lake, for example, that can generate very significant waves. And we've seen that here on Vancouver Island uh, in 1946, a uh, magnitude 7.3 earthquake beneath in the Port Alberni area uh, caused strong shaking that triggered landslides into many of the lakes throughout Vancouver Island and, and uh, cause some very, very significant waves with wave heights of 10 meters or more. So it is really important to know that if, if you're near a lake, if you're near a, an inlet or the open ocean and you feel strong shaking for a minute or more, um, that's your cue to move to high ground, to move away from the water and, and to high ground. So it's, um, in a sense, you know, many earthquakes, not every earthquake, but many earthquakes can trigger tsunamis. 
And as Allison said, the first wave is not necessarily the largest. Um, often the water recedes. That's the first sign of a tsunami. So the water level is dropping. Um, or it could be the second, third, or fourth wave that is the largest. And it can go on for hours. So after the shaking, it's important to stay uh, until we know that the event is over, until there's an all clear. I think, um, John, that's such an important point. And I think also, you know, living on the coast, it's really important that we know where high ground is. Um, and so, you know, when we're on vacation, that we're being mindful and we're, we're taking stock of, of where we are and, and making note of where high ground is um, and that the earth shaking is our tsunami warning. Um, better to be safe and move to high ground and have the all clear than, than not to make that not to make that move um, quickly. I think this transitions well, Allison, into your early earthquake or earthquake early warning. I always want to say it the other way. Um, project. So I think you're sharing. Okay, I'm just going to show a couple slides because it's a little easier to describe with if I've got the image. Um, can you see my cursor? You can. Okay. So um, I recently, well, a year ago, I uh, joined a, a project in, 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 uh, in Natural Resources Canada to create an earthquake early warning program system for um, at risk areas of Canada. So this is a system where we have a special series of seismometers. They're um, much faster. They're different style than the ones we use for earthquake monitoring. And what they do is they pick up the P wave, which is the first wave that emanates from an earthquake or the faster wave that emanates from an earthquake. Is that usually that little jolt or rumble that you experience? And that is detected by the sensors. This, the data is sent to the data center, and then alert is sent out to people and systems, um, which hopefully will receive the alert before the arrival of the more damaging S waves. And that's the, those are the big side to side motions that cause a lot of damage in, in earthquakes. Um, the system only provides seconds to tens of seconds of warning, so it's not very much time. But it's amazing how much you can do in that time frame that will make people and systems a lot safer. So it allows these protective measures to be taken. I do need to alert you that um, even when this system does go into, into place um, in a few years, um, there will almost always be an area close to the earthquake's epicenter where it's simply not possible to send the alert before the arrival of the, of the strong shaking. Um, the idea is the alert goes out when it's received automated systems can trigger actions that can make things safer so they can open fire, fire hall and ambulance day doors so that those vehicles can get out the doors don't jam they can close off valves to hazardous substances they can move elevators to the nearest floor and open the doors a lot of people have gotten trapped in elevators in earthquakes they can send up an alarm in a hospital so that surgery can be stopped the patients can be covered um, trains can be stopped Planes can be diverted from landing. Traffic can be stopped from going into dangerous situations and hard drives can be parked. And that may not sound important, but when you think about the important information that's on hard drives, including for emergency response, this is a good thing. Then of course, we want people to do that drop covered hold on. And people will re be receiving these alerts automatically to their phones and other means of communication. Uh, they don't need to sign up for them and they don't need to pay. This is all entirely freely available. So it'll be sent out by the, uh, the National Public Alerting System. And I'm really excited about this because it's an amazing technology. It's been proven in other countries like Japan, recently in the United States during the Ridgecrest earthquake sequence, Mexico, China, Taiwan. So um, we, are, we are also um, getting that technology in Canada. And um, for me, this is incredibly exciting and it can make a huge difference. This coupled with our building code and having this sort of educational um, component where people are learning what to do when they receive that alert. These are all things that are going to make us a lot safer from those earthquakes. I think that um, Alice and I love this and I, I love that the passion um, that you that you bring to this project because I think that's important and it's it's exciting to me to think that um, you know how many lives could be saved or how, how we can mitigate injuries and mitigate you know long-term damage. You think about those hard drives um, you know, if a system was to crash, I think about our financial systems and getting that critical infrastructure back online. If, if we can find a way to mitigate that, that has such value. Um, one of the questions in the chat is what's the timing of the early earthquake warning system, uh, sort of coming online. 
Oh, for it to come online. Um, it will be operational in 2024. We will probably have some testing in, in the year before that. Um, and of course, it's being um, it's being implemented in BC first. Um, I'm the only person on the team who's in BC, but I'm I'm rooting for that. And so we're getting BC first because, of course, it makes sense. We've got more earthquakes here. The average is higher. Um, the, the hazard is higher. And then it'll be also in, um, installed in, along the Ottawa River Valley and the St. Lawrence Seaway. That's another area of Canada that has is quite significant hazard for earthquakes. Um, and then we might be going into Atlanta, Canada and up into the Yukon. So um, this is something that it takes years to develop. Um, it uses really cool technologies. And um, I'm, I'm stoked. Awesome. Thank you. This is exciting. This is, this is, this is a big deal for Canada and I, I'm excited to see it, you know, sort of roll out. I think um, you might've just surprised a few folks who didn't know that um, one of the other seismically active regions in Canada is that, um, that corridor, you know, Ottawa, Montreal, et cetera, that Ottawa basin or valley there. Um, maybe we can shift gears a little bit here and uh, I'm going to, I'm going to pull up another poll here, but one of the other questions that was asked in the chat, and I'm not certain, um, maybe Jerry might know the answer to this. And that is, um, it, what is the availability of earthquake resistant devices for hanging pictures? So Allison talked a little bit about, you know, making sure that we're securing things, you know, to the wall, our water heaters and shelving and things like that. But what about pictures? So I don't know about per se gadgets, though I do I do know in other countries they have have some things. What I use in in the in the house and um, and what I've seen in art galleries and such, uh, quite often people will like for a picture they'll literally screw that into the uh, the studs, especially if your picture is uh, hanging behind your bed. <laughs> During an earthquake, you don't want that falling on your head. Um, but there are some products out there that people can go buy. Um, you can go to the fabric store. You can buy Velcro that is sticky on both sides by the meter. I love this stuff for earthquake stuff. Um, because, you know, really, we're not supposed to have knickknacks and stuff because they're going to go flying. I'm sorry. I can't get rid of them all. So <laughs> I do. But I use the, the, the sticky uh, stuff. And uh, you'd be surprised how well that works. I went to move something. I couldn't remove it. So it, it, that's, a, that's great. It's a good one. And I have another example of, of another little a cheap item that I bought um, in the dollar store. It's that ticky tack for when you are in a place where you're not allowed to use tape on a wall, like in a, a hall of some sort. I bought some of that and I had these Royal Dalton plates and I stuck it behind each plate and I had them hanging on my wall and I thought, oh my God, that's just so lovely. And then there was that earthquake, the Nisqually earthquake and everything was shaking in the house. Our picture window literally went warm, like so, and everything was rattling. But those pictures didn't, the plates didn't fall. And, you know, and, and I didn't think about it. The next day I was going around and looking at things. The pictures had, the plates had actually come off the hook it had come off but the the sticky ticky tack stuff they were still stuck to the wall so they're little cheap little devices I they're not going to work I'm sure it's not going to work during a nine but for something smaller you'd be surprised what does work so but clearly if you wanted to use um you know screwing literally screwing in your your picture frame into the studs and uh, the other question I get which is a similar type thing is about um the kitchen and your, your cupboards. Um, up here in Canada, they don't sell the same devices uh, you get in the States, but you can always buy uh, the locks that you buy for um, child locks. Mm -hmm. And that'll do the same thing to keep things from coming out of the cupboards. You know, not very pretty, but they work. And, and it's, and it's about, you know, keeping the debris from falling out, falling as, out you're, you. as you're trying to drop cover and hold on, or if you were, you know, when it was safe to leave your home, you don't want to be um, stepping over those things. Someone in the chat very kindly posted a, a picture hanger. So that's great. And you're, oh, right I on. think your point, Jerry, is well taken around, you know, screwing those um, picture frames into the wall in hotels. We see that now where they are not hung on the wall, they're actually screwed into the wall. And that is um, that preventative measure, probably also from people lifting them, but certainly um, it is a preventative measure from, uh, from an earthquake perspective. And, and you can actually use that uh, double-sided, the, the sticky Velcro actually on a picture as well on the wall. I used to work at an art gallery and that's actually how we hung the pictures in the art gallery. 
Cool. That's a great <laughs> tip. It's a great, yeah. everybody's going to go out and be buying the Velcro, uh, double-sided sticky stuff. <laughs> yeah. By the meter. Land. I don't, I don't own any shares <laughs> in it, but it works. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, I've got another question in the Q&A and I'll look to Allison or John to, to respond to this one. Uh, the question is, when you say the West Coast, um, what is, is where the earthquakes will occur? Can you define what makes up the West Coast? How far east and how far north does that go in the province of BC? That's a great question. So who would like to take well, that? Um, the earthquakes tend to happen fairly in a fairly defined area it's not they're not limited to this area but they tend to happen um along our coastline you know uh, 100 kilometers or so from the the mainline coast inland and then out to the co to the water the outer water coast um but if it, you have a really big earthquake like the mega thrust earthquake people could feel that earthquake theoretically as far as the saskatchewan and manitoba border so the bigger the earthquake, the further it's felt. Um, of course, the further you are from the earthquake, the type of shaking you get is different. Um, it tends to be longer periods. So it's, you know, when they're that far away, it's someone sitting in a tall building and they're just feeling a slight swaying. Whereas with the closer you are to the earthquake, the more high frequency the shaking is um, and, and the more strong it is uh, it, and uh, the, the, the more damaging it will be. Um, so in terms of uh, where earthquakes can occur, they can't happen anywhere, anywhere at all. We don't have a zero hazard area in Canada or in, in the globe, really. But you're, you're not going to get the really large damaging earthquakes, generally speaking, in central parts of Canada. It's, it's, it's very solid rock. It's very dense. Um, it's, it's old. Um, Whereas along the coastline, you've got those tectonic boundaries and, and that's where you have the, the, the opportunity for lots of different types of earthquakes. And, and, and um, so the closer you are to the coast, the higher your hazard goes up, generally speaking. Great, thank also, you. Also, I should mention, there are some earthquakes that happen along the Rocky Mountains too. Um, one of the folks in the chat just, just mentioned, um, so Pamela uh, in Vancouver is just mentioning here that they offer emergency or neighborhood emergency personal preparedness to the community. Right now it's happening via Zoom. I know here in Nanaimo and at the regional district of Nanaimo and the CRD, I know Saanich, like so many communities offer um, that personal preparedness and the opportunity to learn from the experts and to ask good questions. So I'll just give a little plug to the, to the community emergency programs and encourage folks to seek those out in their home community. And you can really then understand what is the risk in your community. Those are the folks that know um, and can give you a really good sense of, you know, what the risk of flooding, for example, might be, or the risk of, of, um, of tsunami, you know, where high ground is, these types of things. So there's really an opportunity there to connect uh, locally. I think that was a really, really important point. Um, I'd like to change gears uh, one more time, <laughs> if I can. And I'm going, I'm going to do a quick poll first, though, Mark, before I go to you. So get your slides ready. Um, we'll do one more poll here and we'll just, we're inviting our friend Mark. Um, I'm calling him Sir Mark Spencer because it sounds fancy and he works for BC Hydro. Um, and they're such a great partner of ShakeOut, always willing to contribute and, and share with us how we can be safe. So I've got a poll up on the screen. How far away should you be from a downed power line? So you can go ahead and, and make your selection. There are no there's no judgment, so it's okay to make a guess. Give folks just a minute here. So five meters, 10 meters, or two meters. I'm gonna go ahead and share this. Mark, you'll be happy about this. Folks are saying 10 meters, the length of a bus. Exactly I'm right. I'm pretty sure that's exactly correct. That's great to hear. Yeah, so please, Mark, feel free to, to take it away. Share with us what Hydro's all right, thank you. Uh, let me just share my presentation here. I have a very short presentation. There's a joke behind the uh, Sir Mark, which is that uh, Jen asked me today what my title was, and I said, "You mean like Sir?" <laughs> so uh, what I'll uh, let me just uh, find the way to uh, present here, and uh, one second here. Sorry about this. All good. It looks great. 
Okay, sounds good. I can't see it. It's it, it's showing for me. <laughs> Don't know if that's helpful. I got it. There we go. So once again, Mark Spencer over at BC Hydro. I look at public safety. Uh, I like to raise a public awareness around work, anyone that's working or interacting in any way with our power lines. And I want people to make the connection with um, between power line and earthquake because power lines, much like um, uh, with a windstorm or anything that uh, that might cause some some havoc with the with the natural environment. Power lines. We have uh, BC Hydro has eighty thousand kilometers of power lines with, around BC around the province of BC, and we want to make sure that people are safe around it. So when there's a windstorm, trees fall on lines and so on. Uh, they can bring lines within uh, within reach of people. Um, much like uh, the situation with the with an earthquake. So if an earthquake takes place, we would expect that trees might come down onto lines that poles might be undermined or, or affected and lines could come within reach. Two things I want you guys to think about. Uh, what, first of all, watch for down lines. The system is safe under normal circumstances, but you know our, our poles are set in the ground. They're set uh, deep enough to, to be safe, but nonetheless, there's a possibility that in an earthquake, the ground could become unstable. And when that happens, uh, the, tree, the poles potentially could, could be moved. Uh, when that happens, then the, the lines associated with those poles come within reach. I want you to know what to do. So BC Hydro equipment is not insulated and it's not safe to touch. And if you find yourself within that 10 meters of a power line, uh, I want you to, uh, or of a down line, I want you to shuffle 10 meters heel to toe until you're, like I say, the tilt, until you're 10 meters away from that power line. That 10 meters is about the length of a, of a big yellow school bus. People seem to know that. That's great. That's a good visual to have. We have this campaign running uh, every fall, uh, down danger dial, and I want you to think about that as well. So down, watch for down lines. Danger, recognize that every down line is dangerous and stay back 10 meters. And dial, dial 911 to ensure an emergency response. And the reason we don't want people to call BC Hydro when, there's a, when they see a down line is that we are not first responders. So uh, by calling 911, you ensure that the uh, fire department or other first responders will attend the site, lights and sirens on an emergency basis. BC Hydro isn't prepared to do that. We'll get there as soon as we possibly can, but those first responders will have an inside channel to get hold of us as well. So we'll get there as soon as we possibly can, but to, to ensure that there's an immediate response uh, we recommend people call 911. And the last thing I've got here is to be prepared for outages. So uh, in the background, when there's a windstorm, um, we we're, we're generally know about a windstorm uh, a day or two ahead of time, and we'll muster our crews, we'll prepare in advance, we'll have a lot of behind the scenes act activity going on so that we're, uh, we can respond quickly. But when an earthquake happens, we don't know when it's gonna happen, we don't know where it's gonna happen, and there's also a possibility that things like bridges and roads could affect our ability to respond. So, if, uh, for example, a, a place like Richmond, it, depending on the, the amount of uh, infrastructure damage, yeah, if there's bridges out, um, it's possible that we might not be able to respond for a, for a period of time. Please be careful and stay away from power lines, even when the power has been off for a while. We're always trying to get that power back on. I heard uh, some talk, um, if you remember a couple of years ago during a windstorm, we had a large scale outage to Salt Spring. And I heard stories that people said after a couple of days, well, if the power is, uh, if, if the power is not off by now, it, you know, it, it basically, it must be off by now, but it's been a couple of days. And the thing to consider is that we're always trying to get power back on. So a uh, down line is, needs to always be considered as, as a hazard. We need to, you need to always stay back that 10 meters from a down line and call 911. Awesome. Any, uh, Thanks, yeah, Mark. You. Such good info. And I have to tell you, I hear regularly on the radio, the station that I listen to, they've been saying um, a down power line is an emergency. So I think your, your comments about calling 911, that's a good, good, just a good way to reinforce that message. Um, and, you know, I will say a few, a few years ago, uh, I was part of the folks that was, I was without power for about five days, we had a generator, so we were just fine. Um, but I heard that very often. Uh, we had a lot of down lines and, um, 
and the, you know, the misconception was that they weren't energized. So I think just so good to just reinforce that message. Um, someone in the chat made a note about, um, you know, post earthquake, should we be dialing 911? Um, and if we do not dial 911 and it isn't available and we see downed wires, what should we do? So you're, well, you're, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, so, sorry, Jen. Um, 911 would be the first choice. If you can't get hold of 911, um, obviously you can call BC Hydro, but uh, 911 would be the priority. The, the priority is, is to get the, the best response. And, and uh, they're generally very well equipped for that. You know, they, they have their call centers and they, uh, uh, in general, I would expect that 911 is, is the most prepared for, of anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, BC Hydro, on the other hand, will open up uh, our call centers to emergency response as well, but that's more to take calls um, from, from the first responders. So it, it's very, uh, uh, it, it'd be a challenge, it would likely be a challenge to get through uh, to BC Hydro as well. Well, and I think, um, you know, it's important to let uh, emergency officials together with BC Hydro make the decision about where and how to respond most effectively, right? To, to um, ensure the greatest safety for, for folks that are being impacted. But it's possible in an earthquake that, you know, those systems will be overwhelmed. I mean, I, I think we just have to recognize and be patient um, and just, you know, try to try to be safe um, in, in the best way we can. That's completely um, so, correct, Chet. And, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, but to ensure that emergency response, uh, that's that's a critical element here. And uh, it, the only way you're going to get that is with the first responders. And in, in, in most cases, they'll send the fire department out there. And the fire department, lights and sirens, response, uh, it's, a, it's a different situation when we're, we're, we can't, we have to stop at all the red lights, we're not allowed to speed, and, and so on. So it is a, a, a downline is an electrical emergency, it is an emergency, and we want people to recognize that. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Mark. Great Thank info. You. Thanks. That's so great. Um, so now I, I want to just change gears. We, I've just recognized that we've got about eight minutes left. And I want to ask our, all of our panelists, I know they all have a robust emergency kit. So I want to know what is your favorite thing or the thing, I won't say the most important thing, your favorite thing that you've put into your emergency kit. So we know that you can personalize them. Right, you should have all the all the key components in your in your emergency kit: food, water, pet supplies, um, documents, cash, keys, you know, all of that good stuff. But what's your what's your favorite thing? I'm going to go to Mark first because he's on because he was unmuted. I could see your smiling face. <laughs> My flashlight. <laughs> your flashlight. Okay, <laughs> that's a that's a good. That's like such a BC Hydro answer. I love it. <laughs> the backup system for hydro. I like it. Exactly. Okay, that's great. Awesome. Thank you, John. Over to you. Yeah, um, I would. I, I agree. I, I, I like a uh, headlamp, so both of your hands are free to carry things or, or work. But one of my favorite items is also hydro related, and it is this, uh, which is a power bank, and this will charge my cell phone about five times. So I uh, top this up twice a year, and it will keep my cell phone going for uh, for a week. Which is amazing. Um, I, I, I also have one of those in my kit. So I think that's a good tip for folks. Um, Allison, how about you? Well, um, I'm someone who likes really good food. Um, <laughs> and I, I find it's a comfort. And the thing is, I think if you've been through a traumatic experience, you need to be comforted. And so I, I quite like spicy food. So I've got um, really good Indian food and chili peppers in my kit. Amazing. Okay, Jerry, over to you. The chili peppers, I like that. Well, and like John. <laughs> <laughs> She's got her phone back. <laughs> but it's not my most favorite thing. Uh, we were discussing this earlier and I'm going to confess what we all talked about earlier. Mine is a very good bottle of red wine. One, ha you know, I could go to Alice <laughs> and enjoy her, her uh, curry with my red wine. But I will say this really is an important item. And Mark, the reason I have it out besides tonight is because we do know we've got some uh, a wind warn warning coming and I wanted this charged ahead of time because I know my cell phone is going to light up. But um, really, you do need to have a few things to look forward to. So that good bottle of wine or uh, a nice chocolate bar or 
emergency bag of potato chips emergency chips we talked a little bit you know we joke about our friends in Atlanta Canada my friends in Atlanta Canada have storm chips and I think we should have earthquake chips that are emergency chips that's I think we should always have those so Jerry and I are in agreement I also I don't know if you can see this but I've got some candy this is always in my emergency kit as well um, I also happen to have a 10 year old. So I also have random things like stuffies and books and things to keep her occupied that if we were literally kind of camping out and we had no power and, and such that um, I would want to keep her safe and occupied. So uh, those are those are my tips. And we'd love to see your tips in the chat. You can feel free to type in, do you agree with our storm chips or emergency chip um, that's needed or, or what's your comfort item? And Jen, I have one more thing I'd, I'd like to add to that emergency kit. You know, as much as we know we have to have our water, our basic needs is three liters of water per day per person, every single person and your pets. You also need water for basic hygiene. And at some point, you know, you'll, you'll only have so much stored. You've got to start figuring out where you're going to get your water. And it, water is heavy to carry. So one of the things I do like to have in the emergency kit are other ways of looking after basic hygiene. So having that hand sanitizer, um, you know, one of the things about COVID, we all have that now, but the but you can buy the different wipes, the wipes for cleaning your hands, the wipes for your face, all of that. And that way you're reducing the amount of water that you have to take away from, from your basic needs. So, it, it, you know, so that's the other thing I think people should be aware of, planning water. The great, great tip. I actually did a little quiz with my, with my students today. And I said four liters of water per person per day and make sure you count your pets. And, and they said, what if I have a fish? <laughs> it's like, well, okay. All right. But if you have a dog or a cat or any other sort of animal that might require water, please consider that when you're planning. Um, one of the other things that uh, I want to make sure that we sort of touch on here today is um you know, the, I think the rule, and maybe Jerry, you can sort of speak to this, but that, you know, the importance of being self-sufficient and, you know, government is going to be, local government is going to be focused on other things. So, um, you know, my, I guess my question is, um, you know, that critical infrastructure, can you give a kind of a sense for folks of what critical, like what local government going to be doing in the immediate aftermath of an, of an earthquake that where we all need to be kind of looking after ourselves and our neighbors, um, what's local government going to be doing? they're going to be trying to figure out how do we how do we get a road open how do we clear the debris mark was correct in saying that you know you're going to phone 911 and they want to have the first responders there to block people the hydro how is how are how are they going to get there you have to clear the roads all of that is going to take time that's a lot of logistics so local government their emergency operations centers their eocs this is what they're going to be doing and obviously they're going to have to do that remotely but um you know it is a lot of work you think about the lower mainland how many over underpasses how many highways uh, up and down vancouver island and you know, all those transportation corridors are used for moving food and goods and stuff. So yes, you've got to be self-sufficient. Um, if you're on the islands, and, and Vancouver Island is a giant island, but you know, you, I, I would say you've got to be ready for about a, a month. You've got, you know, really, um, an earth, a big earthquake is a big deal. And I noticed in the chat, uh, somebody did bring up about liquefaction over in Vancouver. Again, that's going to affect the infrastructure and moving things. So local government is going to be just working their butts off. And we are going to be hoping people are coming from the other side of Canada to help us. And that's, that is the truth. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, and so just again, creating that awareness and, and setting and setting that expectation for folks. So I'm mindful of the time. I want to do one last poll and we'll just see that every, I'm sure everybody's going to get this one, right? Um, Cause y'all are such a smart crew. So what do you do in an earthquake? Um, do you run outside? Do you drop cover and hold on? Or do you get into a doorway? Oh, so far unanimous. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so we'll go ahead and share this. So really what we want people to do is to do that drop cover and hold on. So get under a table, get under your dining table, get under your desk, get under a coffee table, even under your bed if you have to. You wanna get under something, hold on, cover your neck, cover your head. 
um, to the best of your ability. And for folks that um, use a mobility device, so a wheelchair or perhaps a walker, we, we want them to lock and then drop cover and hold. So lock their device and uh, you know lean over to the best of their ability, protecting their head and their neck. Um, so important reminder is tomorrow is ShakeOut. It is officially the biggest earthquake drill in the world. And so we hope that everybody is gonna join in. I know you're gonna see all of us on Twitter tomorrow posting our pictures of us under our respective desks. <laughs> um, and so we, we encourage you to post your pictures, tag us at ShakeOut BC. Um, tag us or just tag uh, drop cover and hold on and and we want to see how you shake out so you can show us how you shake out so I want to say um, a huge thank you to all of our panelists thank you so much for for your time and your sharing your expertise again with all of us um, Alice and John Jerry and Mark we, we appreciate you so thank you and uh, good night everybody we will post this on um, on our YouTube channel so you can 